Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, I'm pretty good. Good to see you after all these strangers. Good to, good to see you. Good to hear you. Um, I, we're building a huge blogging heads empire. We are, and we just kind of, it's kind of one uh, technological breakthrough after another that we unveil. Um, and today's uh, technological breakthrough is the Dingle Link, which, which is? allows you to, well, first of all, it's named after our behind the scenes uh, technological wizard, Greg Dingle. Genius, I think he is. G and genius. Those two are not mutually exclusive. Um, it, it is a URL and a way of generating these URLs that can lead you to any particular point within a dialogue. So in the past, uh, you had to, if you wanted to alert a friend to something, you might send them an email with a link, and, and you would say, if you click on this link, then within a few minutes, you will see Bob demonstrate right. his intellectual and moral superiority over, over Mickey. Now you can create a link that says, click on this, and, and you will, as soon as you click on it, see the very moment when Mickey's ego is crushed, okay? Um, I look forward to that. That's great. Yeah, and, so and that, that is just a, a surgical strike that, that people are now capable of doing on their own. Well, There's a little button they will see below the TV screen that says uh, Create Dingle Link, uh, and if they click it, uh, I mean, there are also instructions that they can get by clicking on the question mark, but if they click the button at any point, then the link, the URL that they then see in the address bar of their browser will be the Dingle link. They can then uh, paste it and copy it into an email so or onto a blog. That, that's badly needed because so otherwise videos are sort of cumbersome to link to, and in this way it should be just as quick as linking to a blog. It's revolutionary, man. I, I do think it's going to change. The singularity is approaching rapidly. I do think it's going to... I think this is the first sign of either the singularity <laughs> or the apocalypse. Change is accelerating. Yeah. Uh, now, I should add that that's a very good a Firefox thing. browser, you need to get a download to use the Dingalink button. Uh, and if you have a Safari browser, it may be forever impossible to use it. But regardless of your browser, by looking at the formula we explain in the help thing, you can just generate the, the URL manually and, and email it around regardless of, of, of what browser you use. Um, and, uh, and, and the Firefox download is pretty straightforward. And by the way, if you are using Safari, in which case you're probably having trouble seeing this in the first place, I think, it's one of the most problematic browsers from our point of view, you should be advised that Macs can also use other browsers. I mean, you can download Internet Explorer and, and so on. So. Cool. Well, I'll start using that, and we'll see what happens. Do I think I think it's going to change everything? I think the, the the IPO numbers we were we were projecting only a few days ago have tripled, quadrupled. Okay. Well, um, uh, yeah, no doubt you'll be moving to a better neighborhood as a result of this. Um, you're in a pretty good neighborhood now, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, cool. Uh, well, so the big news that we have to talk about first is Donald Rumsfeld. There's been this sort of rebellion of the generals seemingly out of nowhere. As, as Slate pointed out, there are about 4,000 retired generals, and only six of them have called for Rumsfeld's resignation. Well, now let's be clear on that number. That was actually, I, I think that the number that, the, that Rumsfeld is circulating in his little press advisory is 8,000, to, to stress what a, what, a, what a small number are, are actually complaining. But let's be clear. Uh, you know, the number you would look at, first of all, I think all of these are at least two-star generals or, hi or higher, and I think that's less than half of the generals. Uh, also, uh, they are all retired because they can't speak out while they're active, and I think the 8,000 number included active and, and, uh, and retired. And also, these are all people, I think, who actually had something to do with Iraq, and that further narrows well, down the number. Well, that's a that's a that's a little iffy because, like the the highest ranking one is General Zinni, who 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 opposed the Iraq War from the get go. I think he called for Rumsfeld to retire before the war even resign before the war even started. Practically, he he's always been totally hostile to Rumsfeld. He may be right. I mean, events have sort of proven him, you know, out. But he, but he was a vigorous opponent for, of the war for a long time. Well, he's a Colin Powell buddy, and Powell and Rumsfeld had their issues. Um, but, I mean, I actually have some, some problems with, with this. And, you know, um, you know th this issue of, of civilian control of the military, 
uh, some people worry about about the kind of the precedent this sets when generals start. You know, if we start deposing uh, secretaries of defense based on some kind of informal vote uh, of generals. And I actually, I actually think there is a little bit of an issue here. Um, the the uh, the only liberal blogger I've seen call attention to this uh, is Kevin Drum, and in a way, it's ironic because. Uh, the people who should most worry about undue influence of the, of the military on the civilian part of the government, I would say, is people on the left, right? Of yeah. course, in this case, they're, they're delighted to see Rumsfeld get, get his come up, and so they're not really complaining. But right. I do think it's an issue. I just, uh, I just saw another blog, The Adventures of Chester, that says exactly the same thing. That's a left-wing blog? Uh, uh, I can't tell, actually. We can link to it. We'll link uh, to both of them. I, I will link to it, but... um. Uh, it makes exactly that point. I guess I am. There's nothing that viscerally disturbs me by what these generals are doing. I think anytime generals come out in favor of uh, against the war, uh, th that that's sort of uh, like an admission contrary to interest, and that's that's sort of better well, than it's better than if they had all if they'd all attack Les Aspen for being too much of a peace stick, which I think they did in fact. And, you know, six generals, it, it seems to me democracy can tolerate it. They're citizens, too. Well, yeah, it's not, the, like, it's not it, like they're sitting generals doing this. But it could be 600. I mean, if you say this is an okay thing, then it may not be six next time. I mean, the line that I would respect is the line between... I would, I would emphasize the fact that these guys are retired. What would really bother me is if active duty generals were starting right. to kind of make their, make their voice known, but in fact, they were in this case apparently doing that because the retired general who wrote the piece for Time magazine said, I'm in touch with people in the military and they want, and they want me to speak out basically. And, uh, and that I find uh, mildly uh, disturbing. And, you know, the, the whole ethos of, of military non-interference has, I think, eroded a little over time as it is. My father was a uh, career army officer and in his day, he retired in the 1970s, but in his day, the ethic was so strong that he, like I think most officers of his day, certainly many of them, uh, considered it uh, one of their professional obligations to not vote in political elections. But, but um, and, and that, I think, is no longer, I think that's kind of fallen by the wayside. But don't, don't you think generals should have spoken up uh, against McNamara during Vietnam? And if so... Then, then you've accepted that precedent. I think it's fine if they do what this one guy did, which is resign and then speak out. But don't, but don't say. And I, and I know, and, and you know, I'm speaking on behalf of several who are still uh, in the in the service, but actively support what I'm saying and know that, and you know, and, and I think it's fine to to quit and then start but talking. That's all these guys have done. Well, no, but the one guy said, "I am giving voice." to people I'm in touch with in the military who cannot speak out. I thought you just said that that was okay to resign. No, I think, that's, I think that's crossing the line. Okay. But, but this blog item says that, it, that the, even the retired people should follow General Shinseki's uh, example and maintain a stoic silence, uh, even though you know, Shinseki has a pretty good case for coming forward and saying, I told you so. Uh, he's the guy who said we needed several hundred thousand troops. And specifically in Iraq. that we needed them for the act, for the occupation, not just for the war. He's not like Colin Powell saying we need them for the war. He right. actually said for the occupation, and he's about the only prominent person who did. Right. Um, and, and General Myers gave a very unconvincing reason why he wasn't really saying that uh, on uh, on George Stephanopoulos on Sunday. Yeah. Um, I mean, do, but, you, do, do you agree that Rumsfeld is not going to go? I, I agree that Rumsfeld is not going to go because what's the point of uh, what's the point of changing him if you're not going to change the policy? I guess, and I, I don't think Bush is going to change the policy. Nor am I convinced he should change the policy. I mean, John Burns came back from Iraq and said, "Look, we have the best. We finally have a decent policy in place. We sort of finally got it right. It'll either work or it won't work. But this is the best we can do. And it's not clear if, if that's the case." Uh, why change it unless Bush somehow feels it's going to buy him a couple more years? Uh, it's weird. I um, I once tried to buy a house, from, an apartment from Donald Rumsfeld, so I know he's a tough customer. Did you deal with him personally? No. Uh, I made an offer and he he rejected it. But um, uh, and then I ran into an entrepreneur who had hired Donald Rumsfeld and 
then had to fire Donald Rumsfeld because, quote, he's not a builder, end quote. Well, that was the theme of this David Brooks column. So, the he's I the anti-organization man, and we needed something more like an organization man if you're going to be fighting a war. Right, and he echoed that, he echoed that, uh, that statement, and, uh, and uh, it, 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 you know, I always wonder why is this guy who was sort of a, an iffy guy in the private sector suddenly is like the perfect guy for the public sector. Do we get the private sector's rejects? Um, well, he, he had been Secretary of Defense already once, so he had some experience. Yeah, no, I understand, but in the private sector he was not viewed as a god the way he is in the, in the public sector. And, and it's a brilliant bureaucrat, and just, you know, he, was, he had virtues and flaws, as, as Brooks says. Nixon, Nixon said he would be president someday. He missed that one, but Nixon was quite in awe of his capabilities. Um, um, do you, but do you find him as just sheerly obnoxious as I do? I mean, at those press conferences, do you just want to strangle him? Or, or this is a I, real test of your ideological heart, Mickey. Really? No, I don't find him that obnoxious. Okay, and I, and, and I uh, you know, I, I also buy the idea that he um, he's one of the few free thinkers in the administration. You know, his famous memo: "Are we creating more terrorists than we're killing?" Well, it was about you know five years too late, but it was at least the right thought. Yeah, but he does have the, the spirit that got us into trouble that is, that is shared by Cheney, certainly, and that's the belief that he is smarter than everyone else in the world, with the possible exception of Cheney. I mean, they are really intellectually arrogant. You see that in his press conferences where he wows us with his, you know, sophomorically pedantic put-downs of reporters who, of course, are not allowed to ask follow-up questions, so, you know, generally bite the dust in these exchanges. Um, it just is, I, I just find it, Totally sickening, and uh, would love to see him subjected to the humiliation of a forced resignation. But a again, I, I, I don't like. There's something that bothers me a little about some aspects of this of this mutiny. Secondly, in political terms, I think it does the Democrats about as much good for him to hang around as a, as a you know a vivid symbol uh, of the administration's failure than for him to be ushered off stage. I don't know. Um. I, I, I wouldn't bother me if he went. It wouldn't doesn't bother me that much, you know. If he stays, if there, you know, I wish Richard Holbrook, when he's writing a, an op-ed piece saying that he should go because we need a new policy, would deign to tell us what the new policy is. Uh, there might might not be one. Richard Holbrook, I find almost as annoying as Rumsfeld. I did not read that piece for that very reason. I just, huh? watching him hold forth is painful. Uh, I agree. But here's, here's, and this is a brilliant segue to our next topic. Okay. It seems to me this is happening now because these generals are worried about Iran. And, uh, and if there are people within the military now who are, who are egging these retired generals on, it's because the people within the military are actually worried that we are going to have a military strike against Iran. And, uh, and they don't want to go along with it, so they're trying to somehow throw a monkey wrench into it. Uh, is it sort of evidence of uh, that, that maybe Seymour Hersh is right? Maybe. I almost get this, the sense that it's really a little more visceral than that. These guys are just fed up. I, I think it's actually more about legacy protection. I mean, they, they you know, they, it's pretty clear the Iraq thing is going to go down in the books as a failure. I think it's clear to these people, and they don't want the Army blamed. Yeah. Yeah. And they and don't want to be personally blamed. Some of them have a per, played a personal role. And it should be... We, we, you have to mention that the army hated Rumsfeld before From the war. The beginning. Even, because he's an obnoxious guy. And no, also he wanted to cut the size of the army. I no, mean, he right. had these he, transformation, he to... transformational ideas that the military bureaucracy hated. He declared war on the military bureaucracy. So it's sort of natural that they would they would hate him, even if we had been at total peace. It is, but I'll bet there are people who could have done a more diplomatic job of that declaration of war than he did. He is an intrinsically obnoxious human being, and that's my last word on the subject. Um, but as for Iran, is that what we're segueing yes, to? Yes, that's what we're segueing to. I mean, my question is, I mean, I've just been on an emotional roller coaster and uh, largely under the sponsorship of the New York Times, I think. I mean, they've run these back-to-back -back pieces, the upshot of the first one, both front page. Upshot of the first one is the threat from Iran is being greatly overstated. Uh, you know, the earliest they could have a bomb is 2010 or something. That was a few days ago. Right. Uh, and now they have one today that says, wait a second, if it turns out that Iran has this, I think it's called a uh, P2. P2 centrifuge, Yeah. then we have to totally recalculate. And they're actually not very specific. In fact, I would say neither of these pieces 
is uh, just a paragon of, of clear and definitive I, I, uh, reporting. I agree. I think they said it was four or five times as fast as the... <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, that, well you... that would accelerate things. Th then we're back at the, the timetable that was suggested uh, by Jackie Shire uh, on our show last, a week or so ago, although she was saying this is if you accept the Iranian projection about when, about what they'll have by the end of this year, and assume yeah. that they'll do to handle things quite capably I, thereafter. I would like to see what she says about what their timetable is after they have this P2 technology. I meant to email her this morning and failed, because she is our go-to gal. She was very things. good. Um, the, uh, so I don't know. I mean, w w it seems to me we're, o we're owed a third piece from the New York Times or something. Um, but there's a reason why they changed their mind. It's because the Ahmadinejad, or however you pronounce his name. Ahmadinejad is one. Ah Ahmadinejad uh, s said, and had this line in something he said, where he said, oh, by the way, we have this advanced technology, which had, hadn't been confirmed before. So there was an intervening event. Is uh, that right? Yes. Uh, the, the Times piece today was cued off a line, something he had actually said. Now, and he may be bluffing, too, but, uh, but, but that's, that's why they, they, they reversed course. Yeah, okay. And I do think it's very clear. I mean, if it's ten years away, it seems to me the kill them with kindness approach is clearly our best bet. Now, uh, wait a and, second. Oh, if, oh it's, if it's ten years away. Here, here's, uh, well, go ahead and finish that thought before. No, I, then, before I, mean, I, the, I think I may have you in a corner, but go ahead. Oh, okay, well, I'm happy to be in a corner because I don't pretend to know that much about this, but I've been convinced by Reza Aslan and Chris Hitchens and just thinking about it that if it's ten years away, you know, Iran is sort of like Cuba. We can kill them with kindness, and uh, you know, and, and, and the, the people there will will get rid of this crazy fanatic. And then, even if they get the bomb, it's much less of a threat. I mean, there are all sorts of mm -hmm. uh, third world, uh, former third world nations like India, and who have the bomb, and we don't worry about India having the bomb because we sort of trust them. Yeah. Uh, and Iran, Iran could be more like that. That is, that's a risky proposition, but, but so is attacking them. Okay, I think I know what loophole you're going to use to get out of the corner and we're about to try to put you in. But anyway, okay. what you just said, the kill them with kindness uh, approach, that's what you say on the left of center blog of Blogging Heads TV. As it happens, Mickey, I have right here in my hand a transcript of what you said on the right wing radio blogger with, with Hugh Hewitt. Are you, are you starting to sweat there, Mickey? I have started to sweat. Uh, you're, you're, you probably got that from my brother who's been writing. I'm way about. ahead of you, buddy. All right. First of all, and this will give you some time to think up what your excuse is going to be, I find this amusing. Hugh Hewitt introduces this. You're on with Glenn, Ron Glenn Reynolds, Instapun. He says, whenever I, Hugh Hewitt says, whenever I try and find the center of American public opinion, I bring on Glenn Reynolds, the Instapundit, to do the center right, and Mickey Kaus of KausFiles.com to do the center left. Together we try and hit the middle of public opinion. Now, Mickey, would you say that the midpoint between you and Glenn Reynolds is the center of the American political spectrum? It's not far off. Oh, Mickey, you are you are almost as deluded as Hugh Hewitt is. Uh, I mean, I if, think you're, you're if, you're, if you're center left, then I am Michael Moore, and I'm not Michael Moore. By the way, this is what Hugh Hewitt goes on to say immediately after this, just to show what balanced judgment he has. Welcome, gentlemen. It has been 70 years and a month since Adolf Hitler sent Nazi troops into the Rhineland, reoccupying it in March of 1936, Mickey Kaus. The, the Iranians announced today that they have enriched uranium. Is there a significant parallel between the Rhineland occupation and today's announcement? I mean... Well, that's what Hugh Hewitt said. You were that's going what he said. I, I think that's kind of a bizarre question. Well, I, I think the answer is no. I, I, I mean, there's no troops some... moving, for example. This, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Go ahead. Now, what was your why? What, what was your? It just seems like a bizarre and strained analogy. Well, there's obviously, you know, there's there's something to it. It's the basic analogy for people who want to, you know, strangle the baby in the bath, strike before somebody becomes too much of a threat. I mean, that's that's an obvious concern. But but you so far you've attacked me for something Hugh Hewitt said. Okay, so now we're going to get to the answer. meat of the matter. You know what I'm going to say. I actually don't. I forget what I said. <laughs> well, here's what you said. You were talking about uh, what what uh, Jackie said on our on our show, and he, this is you talking. Anyway, she said, "Well, you know, uh, we could take it out. We could we could delay it for five to eight years. But what's the virtue in that? In other words, a military strike would delay the program but not end it." You say here about a military strike. I see a lot of virtue in that. 
in that if you believe right now they're two or three years away from a bomb, if you believe that the Iranian government is destined for being reformed from within, when the young people who hate the mullahs grow into political power, the difference between three years and eight years is a big difference. So if by pinpoint strikes we would only set them back five years, that might not be a crazy thing. Now, Mickey, there is a, a loophole you can logically use here. Are you going to well, use the there's right no, one? There's, I, 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 there's no loophole. There's, there's no contradiction at all. I'm saying that, I, you know, if, if it's ten years away or eight years away, the, uh, the strategy of change from within makes a lot more sense. It's, it's obvious. If it's two years away... You know, they're not going to get rid of this guy in two years. That uh, is. Uh, th th that th is th the correct loophole, although it's interesting that you emphasize the one scenario when you're on the right-wing blog and the other when you're not. So you're kind of Why arguably playing to the two audiences. Yeah. But, Mickey, I have a deeper problem That's with this. totally bogus. In both, I emphasize that the change, waiting for change from within and, and is, is a viable strategy alternative to an attack. Okay, let's, let's get down to my devastating assault on the core of your logic here, Okay. Okay. You say, if you believe that the Iranian government is destined for being reformed from within, when the young people who hate the mullahs grow into political power, the difference between three years and eight years is a big difference. Okay? Yeah. So, in other words, if, if, if say, they're gonna, we're going to have secular democracy in the extreme case, say, ten years, and we can delay, uh, you know, and then there's a big difference between them having nukes in three years and them not getting them until eight years, right? Right. Now, you know me well enough, surely to be able to tell me what variable I'm going to accuse you of having ignored here. I actually don't. I mean, you're going to say it, doesn't, it takes a lot longer than 10 years. No, I'm going to say if we strike them, that will probably set back the, the process of secular democratization because it will hurt the, the opposition in Iraq and help the current leadership. Well, of course. As surely as night follows day. So well, you can't just do the math as simplistically as you're doing it here. You have to accept that a military strike will actually aid the, the current president, hurt the forces of opposition, and delay, very probably, the day when secular democracy is envisionable. Well, of course, Bob. Well, why didn't you say that? But that's implicit in the, implicit in the argument is that, you, that you, you don't want to have a military strike if you can avoid it precisely for that and, and other obvious reasons, like that they can retaliate against us in Iraq and it would kill a lot of people and the Muslim world would hit us for decades. Uh, but if, if this madman who, who last, you know, yesterday was meeting with the hidden imam uh, and has an apocalyptic vision of the world and is threatening to wipe Israel off the map every other day, uh, gets the bomb tomorrow, we might not have a choice but to attack and accept the decades of hate in the Well, that's kind of that's, a different that's, argument. To, that, to, that's exactly the argument. That's no, your, your, your argument here, the way you're putting this here is, look, there's X years until secular democracy saves the... You even use the word destined. Look, we believe that the Iranian government is destined for being reformed that, from within. Well, destiny would be impervious to, to outside no, disturbances I, such you're, as you're, a military strike. You're, you're erecting a straw man. I, when I say death, that I mean if we don't attack. Well, obviously. that only, look, Mickey, the fact is, the whole logic here is there's X years until secular democracy saves the day. We put things off as long as we can until then, and if a military strike is one way of putting the bomb off further, then that makes sense. That's a two, you know, and those are the only two variables you're mentioning, and you neglect the distinct possibility that the military strike will delay the secular democratization as well. So then when they do regroup and are ready to build a bomb, there will still be 10 years till, you know, there will still have another 10 years of mullahs ruling. I mean, that's, uh, to, to give any sophistication to the model you're putting forth, you've got to throw that variable in. Good point. You got me. I don't, I don't hear the sincerity in your voice that I'd like to hear right now, Mickey. No, I mean, I mean you're right. The, the, yes, that's completely right. It's a logical flaw that I failed to articulate on the Hugh Hewitt show. Oh, that really shame, took the, shame on me. That really took the wind out of my sails. I, I have a you know ritual whip that I'll flagellate myself with later. I'm not getting the enjoyment out of this. I would if you had continued I, to resist. I'm sorry. I know. I apologize too quickly. That's the I failed to heed the key to married life, which is never apologize too quickly. It's not as fun as it used to be, Mickey. Um. Uh. So. So you're so you're wrong. So, so I was wrong. I failed. Yes, I, um, the military strike is, is not a good way to uh, 
encourage sec uh, change to a uh, more rational government. Well, do we have time? You can retaliate now if you want, if we have time, by telling me what's wrong with my crazy uh, scheme involving a Middle East. Well, well, I actually, you know, I'm I'm usually sympathetic to schemes right. that involve having Israel give something up. Should so, I, should I re reiterate quickly what it is? Yes, why don't you? The logic is nobody around Iran wants him to have the bomb. That includes, includes the Arab states. They would all probably say yes if Iran will sign on to a Middle East peace, uh, you know, kind of nuclear inspection regime that's really intrusive. Yes, you can inspect us. We don't have nukes anyway. Uh, but the thing we'd throw in that would make this really hard for Iran to resist uh, is that Israel would say, hey, look, we will even uh, decommission some of our nuclear weapons. They've got like 200 nuclear warheads. We'll decommission half of them, and, and strategically, there's no difference between 100 and 200. Oh, but that's why, that's why Iran would would reject, because if there's no strategic difference, then they're not getting any advantage. Of oh, oh, a hundred, yes. A hundred weapons is plenty to destroy Iran. Oh, oh so. no, they, they would be getting something huge symbolically, because Israel would have admitted to this thing. It, it would, Israel, in their eyes, would have lost face, and maybe, and maybe it would have lost some face in some sense. But compared to the two alternatives either military action that may well lead to a wider war, or Iran actually getting a bomb, this is the preferable of the three alternatives from Israel's point of view. And in any event, I mean, this would be something, this would be something that, that, that Ahmadinejad could really hold up high and be proud of. In any event, it would be viewed around the world, in Europe and everywhere, as such a revolutionary offer that if he turned it down, we would have a much easier time mustering world support for sanctions or even a military strike. Aren't we having a pretty easy time mustering world support for sanctions? Oh, no, not, the at all. not at all. The meaningful is... sanctions, I mean, meaningful UN activity uh, looks pretty dim at this point, given uh, Ch the China and Russia's attitude. What about Instapundit's point that China and Russia are idiots if they want to have a, a nuclear-armed Iran on their borders? Well, they, they may be, but so far, they, if that's what, what that would qualify them as, then they show uh, every sign so far uh, of being willing to be idiots. I mean, they, they, it, it's unclear. We may be able to get them on the boat, but right now I think a lot of people think the U.N. option is not uh, likely to bear fruit. And, and, and Russia and China are the sticking points in the Security Council. Well, it would be great if you could pull it off, Bob. The, the, um, you know, I, I, I watched your, your, your talk with Jackie Sherrier twice. The first time I thought she was just you know, tolerating your crazy scheme, and that when I saw it again, I expected to see her suddenly smirking and, and, and just indulging you, but in fact, she was not unreceptive to it, so the second time I, I saw it, so... So it's gaining momentum, you would say? It's, it, 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 uh, <laughs> that's perhaps an exaggeration. Thanks. But, um, but it's not a crazy idea, and you know, good ideas come from crazy ideas, so... And crazy people sometimes. Exactly. So, so no, I'm not hostile to that idea at all. I mean, I mean, there's certainly nobody. Nobody has an alternative. So why not consider yours? I'm with you. Um, well, well, in that case, uh, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll happily segue into uh, a, a, a topic that is your home turf. Immigration. Okay. Yeah, there, there, there's actually. There, I, I wanted to talk about that because there, there is a development on immigration which I've sort of been obsessing about, which is. Uh, there have been these hints from pro-Bush people, uh, Fred Barnes and, and also a, a, a little thing in a Novak column, suggesting that when Congress had gone home over the vacation, they discovered that uh, people are much more sympathetic to Bush's proposals for a guest worker and a sort of path to citizenship uh, than, than people like me had expected, and that, that, that they basically love their nannies more than they love their borders. Uh, and that they really don't want to lose this source of cheap, good labor. And so they're perfectly receptive to uh, legalization and letting the people here become citizens. And uh, Now, uh, you know, uh, it's possible that I have fallen prey to the, what Mike Kimsley calls the Howell Reigns fallacy, which is assuming that your views are echoed by the great and good American people. Uh, certainly people like me and Laura Ingram have been sort of belligerent in, in uh as asserting that uh, you know the voters in general want border enforcement and they don't want these other things, uh, uh, legalization and earned citizenship. And there are some polls, recent polls, that suggest that that's wrong. There were some earlier polls that suggested that that was right. So it's it's possible that that, that that's wrong. The American people might not uh, agree with me, and they also might be wrong. Uh, 
but that but it would imply that uh, you know that the people who, who who would try to uh, you know to, to pursue the Bush legalization plan wouldn't be politically insane and they might get reelected. Uh, I'm I'm very suspicious of this trend because it seems to come from a guy named Jeff Bell, who's a big source of Fred Barnes's, who is also a consultant to La Raza. Yeah, I almost got uh, the impression that Fred was about three hours from deadline and uh, called Jeff Bell, and the, well, and the, and the got, piece happened. I got the impression that Jeff Bell called both Novak and Fred and produced yeah. these pieces, and, and I want to see more evidence of this pro-nanny, pro-legalization groundswell before But Fred I, certainly asserted it with tremendous confidence, as I absolutely. guess he is prone to do, like many colleagues. Yeah, and he doesn't usually do that if it's complete hogwash. Oh, is so. that right? I don't well, think. So. Well, maybe he's right. Um, uh, you know, it'd be okay with me if he was. Uh, the one question I have now, you in your in your Bruce Reed dialogue, you said, "What what, what was the scenario you were project? You, you were projecting an enforcement first. You were saying not only is this good, but politically feasible. Enforcement first, and then wait and see in terms right, of things like citizenship the, and amnesty. The more I the more I think about it, the more it's all the timing. I mean. Basically, you you know, you and I and everybody else, <coughs> excuse me, are gravitating to the position of if we really could enforce the borders, you know, what's so terrible about legalization and earn citizenship for the people who are already here? Uh, it, it, in my position is, well, you let's see if we, we can enforce the borders first before we do the second part. But tell me something. Does border enforcement in that context and in the context of the Fred Barnes piece, I had the same question, does border enforcement refer literally to enforcement only at the border? No, the main thing is employer sanctions, uh, obviously. Well, okay. that's, and, see, that's... And, and, and the great fear is not that they'll sneak through the border. The great fear is that the Republicans will never crack down on business. Well, border uh, and, enforcement and, and, and is quite a misnomer, work. then, in that context. I mean, well, it just means you're enforcing the rules that people shouldn't be here illegally. Yeah, but that's so misleading because there is a subset of that kind of enforcement that is at the border. And, and right. my question is... Well, we should come up with a different word. Well, well, okay, but my question is, why wouldn't you see, at a minimum... I mean, first of all, there, there are people like David Korn here on Blogging Heads who said a, a couple weeks ago he didn't think there'd be any administration reform this year. Secondly, once they failed to get it before the congressional break, all kinds of people guaranteed there would be no reform. But I've always thought that was BS. I mean, they said the same thing about welfare reform at this point. Okay, and my question is, why isn't it a political natural to, at the minimum, get something that is just literally border enforcement? I mean, it seems like if there's one thing no, everyone I could agree on, that's, it's just enforce, that, put money into monitoring the border. That's what I've been, that's what I have been... Predicting, and then it's you know Bush was asked, would he veto an enforcement only bill, and he didn't say he would. Right, but you got to be clear. Said, what do you he mean? Has, he hasn't vetoed anything he said he'd veto. He's certainly not going to veto the things he says he won't veto. Okay, but again, enforcement only—that's broader than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about enforcement at the border. That's the political natural. Oh, oh you mean in not doing the employer thing? Well, that, but that's that's silly because the employer thing is the benign inoffensive way to uh, yeah. to do it. Yeah, but in political terms, there's a Republican constituency that d really doesn't like that. And in fact, there's a Democratic constituency. That is, I think the Latinos aren't wild about that. Whereas nobody is against, virtually nobody, no well, sizable sure, constituency say, is against just putting more money into monitoring the border. Well, but people, we've been doing that. And, people, and then the next thing is a fence, and people are opposed to the fence. They think it's an affront to Mexico, and it'll, it's insulting. And Well, no, you can put uh, more money into it without a, a literal fence. And also, you can put a literal fence in really difficult terrain, and then a so-called virtual fence elsewhere. I mean, you can... Well, that sort of, that, uh, you know, that sort of bill might pass. So I'll be very disappointed, because it seems to me the key is, in fact, uh, the employer piece. Okay, but then you start getting into political difficulty. Whereas, I'm just saying, there is certainly some legislation, however minimal, that is a political natural here, and that's why it seems to me you would expect something to happen. No, but, no, I agree, and it's, especially if it's the Republican Congress being terrified, wants something to take home. Right. Uh, and that was, that's what happened with welfare reform. They, Newt Gingrich, you know, Bob Dole didn't want them to pass a welfare bill. He wanted the issue. And Newt Gingrich said, Jesus, we're all going to get defeated unless we pass something. So they passed something and screwed Dole, uh, who was running for president. So I, I, I can easily see something. The, the, the difference is that, you know, the business lobby will, will you know, want, the business lobby is worried that it will work, basically. 
They're worried that the border will be secured and then there'll be a labor shortage. And then the question is, if that happens, then we would want some, you know, we want immigrants. So then we would want some sort of legalized way for immigrants to get in the country. And how quickly could you gin that up? That's why I say it's all a question of timing. And that's why I don't think it's crazy to have a, if, you're, if you want a broader piece of legislation, to have some sort of standby, uh, you know, guest worker program with earned citizenship at the end of it. You know, there's no reason why people come to the country legally in a guest worker program and can't over 10 years earn their citizenship. There's nothing wrong with that. Although, like some others, I'm a little uncomfortable with the guest worker concept. But uh, anyway, well, but, what's but your, if, what's they, your if they can become citizens, then it's not... Then that eliminates most of the. Well, then it's kind of a misnomer. But but uh, what's your prediction? My prediction is still that some lowest common denominator enforcement approach will pass. Uh, it could be as minimal as you're saying. That would be sort of pathetic. Thank you. Uh, my my guess is that you know, there'll be at least some employer piece. The, you know, the question is always, will it be enforced? You know, will. Uh, you know, will, 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 will people stick it to employers who have a very powerful lobby and, you know, tend to cheat when, when, they, can, when they can get away with it? Um, uh, and, and you think that will happen when? Within a few weeks? No, no, it will happen at the end. It will happen at the end of the summer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's what I would think. Okay. Um, Anything else on immigration? Uh, no, I guess that's it. Uh, no, that's it. Okay, now... You're going to try to convince me that this scandal about page six, the, the gossip column at the New York Post, is worth my time. And it's not worth your time. It's 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 it, 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 you should you should pay attention to it. It's important to your world. L uh, let, let me tell you how much time I've devoted to it. And first of all, if there's anybody who doesn't know, it's this it's this contributor to page six, not a staffer, but who allegedly was blackmailing a guy saying, you're going to have to pay me off if we're going to withhold negative information about you. Um, this guy, Burkle. Um, Burkle is the guy who was being, who was the alleged victim. Who, who set up a sting to document this right. blackmail. Now, my, my, my reaction was glee, of course, because these are all the kinds of people who are caught up in this are exactly the kinds of people we j I just kind of tend not to like very much, ranging from, you know, the stern, the, the gossip columnist who loves to, to, you know, hang out with the celebrities and to, to kind of the celebrities themselves. I mean, I don't want to say I dislike them all, but, you know, it's kind of a part of the world that grosses me out. And, um, but then it's I my started, world, Bob. What's that? That's my world. Uh, well, I, you are the one. You are the one exception. The world of glamour you, and blogging. No, no, you've got a leg. You've got a foot in both worlds, and that's what I admire and respect about you. Uh, you, you bridge the the chasm. But um, but then I tried to kind of read about it because I thought, well, indulge your glee, you know, read the story. And I, it was just too. I just did not care. Now, why should I care? You should care, not so much for the journalistic angle. I, in other words. Uh, do we want gossip columns? Does this discredit gossip columns? Should you know? I, I'm I'm all for gossip columns. I think it makes people interested in politics. But uh, you know, if you worry how Rudy Giuliani, who Rudy Giuliani is dating, uh, next thing you know, you're you're talking about uh, capital gains cut, welfare reform. No, but next thing you know, you're talking about well, his policies. I mean, you, you, it, it, this is especially evident in Los Angeles, where nobody cares about politicians, and if they gossiped about them the way they gossip about celebrities, people might pay some attention to politics. It's, in, a, it's in, a slippery slope to substance, the gossip yes, page. Yes, and, and it's actually voting and caring about issues. Um, the second, and it's what, it's what people who care about politics talk about, so why shouldn't we encourage citizens to? No, but the, the important thing is, is this guy, Burkle. I mean, if Burkle is, he made a fortune in the supermarket business, he owned Ralph's grocery stores, where incidentally they sold a lot of tabloid newspapers. Mm -hmm. Um and, hypocrisy, uh, total, total blatant, uh, blatant, hideous hypocrisy, and um, uh, he's since sold them. But he's he's a b alleged billionaire who is Bill Clinton's business partner, and he has a, well in, and, and in he, one venture. I mean, Bill Clinton's probably by that definition got quite a few business partners. I right? didn't see, right, he is a business partner of Bill Clinton. There have been there have been stronger assertions made, but all all we can know is that he's Bill Clinton is an advisor to his. It, you know his investment outfit, and 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 we know that uh, according to the New York Observer, they've done business in Dubai, which was a hot button issue. And the point is, there are a whole.
bunch of potential entanglements for Hillary in this. And if you care about being John McCain, you care what happens in the Ron Burkle uh, uh, area of the world. He's drawn a lot of attention. A lot, and Wait, this, run that by me again. If you care about doing what, then you care about... If you care about beating McCain, and you think Hillary is the horse with which you're going to beat John McCain, I know you don't like John McCain because you think he's never been a war he doesn't like, uh, you, you, you know, it, it, it's entirely possible that Burkle's involvement with Clinton will, A, embarrass Hillary with some Dubai-related business so that, you know, people will begin to suspect that he's more pro-Dubai than otherwise would be if Dubai weren't giving him all this business. Now, there's nothing illegal about doing business with Dubai, but it might bias you to be more pro-Dubai. And there, there, there was an actual conflict with, with the Ports deal where Clinton took one position and Hillary took another. So there might be, is Hillary conflicted by Bill's business dealings? And also, Burkle and Clinton have these parties, and, you know, it's, it's, it raises the whole specter of Clinton's lifestyle that people don't want to get into and that will definitely hurt Hillary, I think, and, and might drag her down, and might drag her down in the general election. So and you... McCain would win, and, 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 and we would have a, a person you don't like in the White House. So that's, you care about it because of the practical consequences. The same way we, there's nothing interesting about the Valerie Plame scandal. The only thing interesting about Plame was that a special prosecutor had, we thought, had the power to knock out Karl Rove. That's why it was interesting. Well, but the issues raised were, were, were large in that case. You may dismiss some of the allegations, but the allegations that the administration was intentionally uh, outing a covert agent uh, as payback, which is the extreme indictment, which I don't entirely buy, but anyway, that's a significant issue. I mean, I deny that it's that interesting. Even if that suppose that were even if happened. that's the true, it's not that interesting. But that's okay. compared it's, to this. I mean, first of all, I, I, so you're not saying that these kinds of scandals generically are edifying or worth paying attention to. You're well, contending I think they're, they're 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 genuinely entertaining because they're part of the human drama and institute and emphasize that the Darwinian impulses of man extend to rich and poor alike, and it's always a blow for social equality when somebody. Rich and famous is brought low. Oh, I certainly so, enjoy it. So, when it as, aside from that, yes, you're right. Okay, so the specific, and they just sound a little attenuated to me. I mean, I've never this is the first time I've heard it, but it sounds to me like you're kind of reaching to to make this sound highly problematic for Clinton in the first place. Wait, it's because of their some I'm Dubai not, connection, and Dubai was somehow connected. I'm not to reaching. The, I think I think Burkle has inadvertently dredged up a whole bunch of issues that. Hillary Clinton wishes he hadn't dredged up. I just the, the connections don't sound strong enough to me. The connections even to Clinton himself don't sound very yeah. strong, and uh, I think this may be wishful thinking well, on your part. Burkle's connection to Clinton is incredibly strong. Clinton stays at his house when he comes out here. I mean, uh, well, I, so I mean, what? I mean, first of all, do we know what Burkle? What What is the negative information about Burkle that they were? Well, gonna, Burkle has a very active attorney, so I'm. I don't want blogging heads to be bankrupted by a lawsuit brought by Martin Singer. Oh, so I'm, oh I'm to echo very, another very great leader, I say bring it on, Mickey. Nothing would be better well, for our e visibility. And, if, you know, if what they want is all our assets, here, let me just get my wallet out. I mean, this is this is, this is is win-win. Go hey, ahead. Let e it go. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on. I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in court. I do, if you want to see the, some investigative leads, I urge you to go to gawker.com where it was actually guest edited this weekend by the New York Post sleazeball uh, in question, Jared Paul Stern, who basically raises every issue about Bill Clinton and Ron Burkle that he can possibly raise uh, without triggering. I mean, he's, he is pretty good at, at raising these issues without triggering legal liability. Mickey, maybe, I maybe beg you my to get us into legal trouble here. Sorry? I beg you to get us into legal hot water. Come on. No, I'm a member. I'm an officer of the court. I'm not going to... An inactive officer of the oh, court. Oh, you are. Not, that's right. You're a lawyer. I, I, I'm, 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 I, I, I want to stay away from that. But that explains uh, a lot. But, uh, but, but you can go to Gawker and... Well, and, and if there's see, all these leads floating see around, how come so far about? you're the only person I know who's exercised about? I mean, I'm sure you can say there are these right-wing blogs, but... Because I'm ahead of the curve, you know? Oh, that's Phil, right. I forgot. Phil, but, Phil Weiss, when Clinton took office, Phil Weiss wrote a memorable column where he said, follow the nookie. Okay, that was his key to, to Mickey, understanding the Clinton administration. Mickey. And Phil Weiss was correct. Uh, if, if that if eventually... Uh, basically immobilized Clinton for much of his second term. Uh, so, you know, Phil Weiss was ahead of the curve.
Mickey, this is a family show, okay? You can't even say that word? I think you meant follow the cookie, didn't you, Mickey? Something like that. Um, so, uh, no, you can say that word. Um, anyway, so people will be, you know, it's today is a cloud as small as a man's hand on the horizon. Tomorrow, who knows? Who knows? But we'll, we'll the, revisit this if you're right, and we'll re revisit it if you're wrong. I, I'm sure you will. Would you like to predict how much this scandal is going to gross? <laughs> um, uh, it's going to gross a lot for Jared Paul Sturin, that's for sure. That, that was an obscure illusion that will be meaningful only to long-standing Blogging Heads TV viewers. Speaking of which, unless you have more to say about this scandal... Uh, I don't. We, we've reached the viewer email uh, segment of our show. Today it's wholly devoted to the uh, motto contest issue, which I think we really should bring to closure. Okay. Um, uh, just a few, a few late entries that are notable for one reason or another. This one, because it comes from a fan in Slovenia, Simon B. Dialogue through the media fog is his uh, suggested motto. Not bad in Not any bad. event. I'm delighted to have a Slovenian. It's the, uh, it's the best Slovenian entry we've had. Yeah, I think that definitely wins in the Slovenian category. Uh, Nathan A.'s submission is, I watched Bob Wright harangue Mickey Kaus about Ann Coulter for 70 minutes and 24 seconds, and all I got was this dialoguing T-shirt. I don't think so, but on that, on that theme, Paul W., That's... Ann Coulter is the Antichrist. I'm afraid that gives her a little too much credit. Um, Jeff Peterson, oh, whoops, I mean, Jeff P., she only says nice things about you, Bob. Jeff P. Su uh, suggests tiny faces, big mouths, huge minds. I'm ambivalent about that one. And, yeah. and I want one that I can wholly support. Now, Mickey, there, oh, here's one from Tom M. Better than a sharp stick in the eye. Thanks for that, Tom. <laughs> the, uh, now, two did come in that I, I think should possibly join the finalists. Let me remind you what the finalists are. Here's one that was inspired by an entry from John M. It is Saving the World One Dialogue at a Time, which, as you know, I like. Right. Sally S. was It's Time to Deploy the Moose, or Deploy the Moose. David Z. was Dialogue Me. Now, here's two that, that I think are pretty good. David F. suggests We Retort, You Decide. Retort with a T. Yeah. I Not think that's bad. pretty good. That is like, pretty good. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you may resist it because it's kind of, in a way, makes fun of a, a, one of your favorite networks. No, I think I may already have used it. Well, I was, it was seeming to me almost too good to be new, right? Well, that's, yeah. I mean, you could, and you could apply it to immigration. We deport, you decide. I mean. Well, yeah, but that would be different. We would not use, <laughs> that would not be our motto. We deport, that would be your motto. We deport, you decide. But no, not our motto. Um. Neil O, this one also sounds almost so good to me that it, uh, you would think it's not new, but it's what would Socrates do? Now think about that, right? Socrates dialogues? He, he, he'd take the hemlock. That's one possible answer, but I'm not sure you're, you're getting the larger point here. Um, I think that's pretty good. The, the only thing I don't like it is, is it might be interpreted as uh, anti-Christian. And... Although, I, you know, you may not realize it, but, but the, uh, the sentiment I exhibited in the Muslim cartoon thing, the Danish cartoon controversy, which was a keen attentiveness to religious sensibilities in the Muslim world, is actually uh, a, 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 something that I extend to the larger religious world. I don't like those uh, Darwin fish bumper stickers, you know, that are a reply to the Jesus, the word Jesus in the fish bumper stickers. Really? Yeah, no, I really don't. And as you know, I'm a little bit of a Darwin aficionado, but I just think they're gratuitously provocative. And they seem to suggest that, uh, you know, there's an incompatibility right. between, you know, science and religion. Right. The sort of thing Richard Dawkins would Exactly. Why start yeah. the fight? I think that kind of thing plays into the hands of the intelligent yeah. design people. Yeah. Now, what would Socrates do is not nearly as aggressively offensive. Do you think Do you think it would be taken, do you think it has an anti-Christian uh, vibe? No, I think it would be taken as a sort of sexual innuendo because of Socrates' alleged sexual practices. Something that hadn't occurred to me, Mickey. I have a filthy mind. Whatever you want to think about, feel um, free to think about it and share it with the world. 
That's what we're here for. <laughs> um, anyway, I, that one doesn't grab me for a variety of reasons. You, you've named one of them. And I just think it's, it's, a, it's what Charlie Peters calls a get up and get a beer line, which is something that seems so profound that you sort of get up and get a beer to think about it, and then you never come back to the topic at hand. Yeah, but it's a T-shirt. We're not asking them to continue reading in this case. I think Charlie was talking about, you know, things that exist in paragraphs of longer stories. No, I understand, but you want you want a, a motto. You want it to punch and make the point. You don't want it to you want you don't want it to provoke thought. You want it to be a thought. Anyway, that's my line. Okay, the thing I, I like about you decide. We, we retort you decide, and what would Socrates do is they don't require familiarity with our oeuvre. To get them, so as as does it's time to deploy the moose, although or diablogne, although those do have the virtue of suggesting a kind of secret world of knowledge that you would love to gain entry to, right? Why well, don't uh, certainly uh, uh, it's of. a teaser? Yes, I think everybody wants to know what the moose is. Um, but uh, what if we? Why don't we have an election between the four or five finalists? Oh man, you gonna you gonna read the email on that one, Mickey? You okay. volunteering for overtime? We well, could just tell people to put like a number in the in the subject line, and we just t t you know tote them up. Well, I think we, we should promise maybe, them we won't actually read. The I think emails. if we make it cost free, there will be too many entries. So I think they should have to send a hundred dollars to me with each vote. <laughs> That's um, the Jared Pearl Stern solution. Well, wait. First of all, can we can we narrow these down at all? I mean, we've only got five, and you know we can have a couple survive. Yeah, I would I would kill the Socrates one, and just have. Oh, well, let's take turns killing him. You kill that. Okay. What would Socrates do? You know, I I've got to say I'm slightly souring on Diavlogmi. Really? Yeah, it's you know, I'm morally conservative. There's vague sexual innuendo there. Well, if you don't like the word nookie, I mean Jesus. Now that's a T-shirt. You're getting there, Mickey. Work. Come on, come on, more, more. What a T-shirt is. Work with that thought, yeah. The T-shirt is. Uh, I'm kidding. You don't kidding. say. Don't say nookie, Mickey. No. No, no, we're not going to have that on our T-shirts. <laughs> so. Well, maybe we should just each choose one we like. Um. Maybe we should each choose two and see if there's any overlap. I like say. Well, let's pretend. Okay, put them in your mind. Which two you like, and no cheating. Um, we have to volunteer the accurate version of what's in our minds. Okay, I've got my okay, two. Okay, yeah. Okay. What I are your two? I circled them. Okay, I'm circled. Die of log me and saving the world one die of log at a time. Okay, we agree on saving the world one die of log at a time. I like we retort, you decide. So, sadly, we're eliminating it's time to deploy the moose. I just think that's too recherche. Well, I, I probably would agree with you if I could remember what that word meant. We could put that on the back of the T-shirt. We could just put recherche on a T-shirt, and that would impress them. Um, so we're down to saving the world one dialog at a time. Dialog yeah. me. We retort. You decide. Yeah. Now, now we probably shouldn't have two that have the word dialog in them, right? Uh, yeah, probably. So on those grounds, we could eliminate dialog, and the two winners would be, you know, because you both both of us chose something over that. So. The two winners would be saving the world one dialogue at a time, and we retort, you decide. I, I think our our inexorable decision-making machine is, has reached Round a conclusion. A it's reached a conclusion with incredible speed. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld really should learn something from us, I think. Consensus building. Absolutely. That's what we just did. We built consensus, and those are the winners. And they will each receive an autographed copy of your book, plus a free massage from you, as I recall, Mickey. Is that right? <laughs> Um, I don't know about the massage, but um, no, I th didn't we say that? I think they get a I, uh, they get a mention in page six. I think it's okay. Well, if you give them a massage, I think it'll make its way into page six possibly. <laughs> um, um, so there we go. So we're gonna uh, some some version of that will be on Cafe Press within like a couple of weeks, right? That'd be great. Some, 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 one version or another of each. I mean, one may be more mug friendly and one more t t shirt we, friendly or something. I think we should go for the. Uh, we retort, you decide, infant creeper. Like what is an infant creeper? It's like something that infants wear when they creep around on the floor. Ah. They had, you could get that at Cafe Press, too. Mm-hmm. I think there'd be a big demand for that. Okay. But <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, cool. All right, so we're, we're uh, out of here, right?
Uh, yes. Uh, see you next time. Okay, see you.